worker, this is your factory. This web of metal and light crammed with intricate machines, drilling, punching, bending weapons into shape, is yours. You thought it up. It was born in the good old Yankee Noodle. The great heritage of American ingenuity has worked miracles here at home. And it's working miracles overseas. Our boys, here's how they live. And dream, some of them. A lot of others, close relatives of Rube Goldberg, are determined to prove that man can stand alone, that males can build and operate washing machines any place, any time, without women. Of course, they really don't want it spread around. With pieces of wire and old wheels, with worn out hacksaws and rusty nuts and bolts, they've improvised gadgets to save time and labor and lives. Here, an old grappling hook, a rope, and a grenade launcher are used to explode mines. The hook is shot out into the field, then carefully hauled back in. As it slides over the ground, it catches any hidden trip wires and explodes the mines. This is a cable binder, invented by a group of boys in the Pacific. Where it used to take an hour to string a line, this gadget does it in 15 minutes. This pole climber in India had another bright idea. Just take an elephant and, well, just take an elephant. An oxygen tank from a P-47 and copper tubing coiled inside an oil drum is all that's necessary for the construction of a still. A still for battery water, of course. It used to take from two to three hours to change one of these big airplane tires. A gadget built with salvaged parts from a bombed out Italian hangar does the job in 20 minutes flat. This dolly with the tire riding along, like a racehorse in its cart, is another labor saving idea. Instead of seven men who used to load and unload tires from standard trucks, it now takes just three. A special wrench, designed and built overseas, tightens nuts and bolts in what used to be inaccessible places. This mobile service and repair unit is mounted on a truck that once carried supplies over the Burma Road. A discarded Jeep motor supplies power for the various tools. Here is the instrument panel, mounted behind the driver's seat. An air compressor is one of the many features of this assembly. A 110 volt generator supplies electric power. Work lights are rheostat controlled. There are drop lights. A soldering iron. An electric drill everything that can save time and labor in the field. The unit is light, easy to handle, it uses little gas and oil, and can be transported by air, a very important feature in the China-Burma-India theater of war. This fortress, its brakes gone, is bound to overshoot the field. Or is it? Coming in on a wing and a prayer, and a parachute. One Yankee Noodle improvised that emergency air brake and 10 lives were saved. The Yankee Noodle was good in peace. It's just as good in war. On the home front, it's accomplishing the day-by-day -day miracle of war production. On the battlefront, the same Yankee Noodle is batting out ideas on an endless belt all around the axis. But the one thought that's in the Yankee Noodle everywhere is winning the war with every tool, every weapon, every idea.
these pictures are from a confiscated Japanese motion picture made five years before Pearl Harbor. The picture shows how officers who are now fighting us were trained at Japan's West Point, Chiquan Gakko. To this Tokyo school every year come the cream of Japanese youth, about 2,000 students. Each has received training from the day he first walked. At the age of 14, the toughest and healthiest are selected. The survivors take special exams. Perhaps 59 flunk, one passes. He goes on to a junior military academy, and after two summers, he moves to the final phase. The first day at Japan's West Point, the CO is welcoming them. We congratulate you, he says. We will train your body and your mind. You will work 17 hours a day, seven days a week. Nothing must distract you from your mission. Remember the words of your first emperor. We shall spread ourselves all over the world. We shall make the whole world our dominion. For men with a destiny, day begins at the break of dawn. Later in the day, there are more practical exercises. The Japanese can't get enough. They make each jump like they're landing on the face of an American. Jiu-Jitsu, their most ballyhooed item. They think it's unbeatable. It isn't. In 10 big matches against American wrestlers, Jiu-Jitsu experts were flattened like pancakes. But the favorite exercise is bending their backs each morning to Hirohito's holy palace. It develops the spine. In the classroom, there is absolutely no instruction in international relations nor economics. Yet the men who are graduated help rule Japan. Their lack of knowledge about other countries, about the qualities of other people, about production, causes them to take wild gambles. But on other subjects, they are very thorough. Trigonometry, chemistry, history. There is a great emphasis on languages. German as an Axis partner. English, they once hoped to use it in California. And Russian. A favorite cultural pastime is kendo. Being pounded on the head is supposed to make a man alert. There are other outdoor studies, signal practice, surveying. And this class in yelling, to prepare a man for giving commands and to try scaring the hell out of the enemy. Eventually, every Japanese officer candidate must specialize. Many go into cavalry school. Others go into the armored forces. The engineers, whose instructors have spent years rigging bridges in China. A popular course at Japan's West Point is the artillery. But the most glamorous branch of them all is the Imperial Air Forces. Bombardiers have their own private workout over a moving map. Later it was Chongqing. Pilots get into the air very early in their training. Later, these men will prepare to die for their emperor in zeros, the Nakajima bombers. Finally, the big day at Chukwan Gakko. The emperor god himself is on hand. A thrilling moment for the Japanese officer, but only a beginning. He must spend eight months in the ranks before becoming a lieutenant. His highest base pay will be the equivalent of $21 a month. He must buy his own uniforms and go into debt purchasing a samurai sword. He may take a wife from the special school for army brides. The honor student of the class receives a special scroll and later will be given a silver watch by the emperor god. Silver instead of gold to teach frugality and living. And for preparing his students so well, the CO receives a special gift from Hirohito. Yes, this is a big day. And every graduate dreams that his training will lead him to one end.
world domination for Japan. But it's being proven otherwise in the stream of ashes being returned to Tokyo. There is a more fitting end, the dead end, for the sword-waving graduate of Japan's West Point. How long will it take these men to get to Berlin, to Tokyo? How many years? How many months? How many minutes? These men are the human minutes of this war. The inevitable doughboy. The infantryman. The foot soldier. One part of millions of parts of the American army. Ever moving forward. Ever taking one step of the millions of steps ahead of them. These are the men who assault the enemy. Who mop them up with small arms fire. Plant old glory in the ground we seize. Most of us think of him as the guy with a rifle and a bayonet. The world's best with both of them, too. But the infantryman has 17 different weapons at his command. He wields flamethrowers, hurls grenades, shoots bazookas, Machine guns, mortars, even light howitzers. Master of half a dozen knives. He storms beaches and shell raked assault boats. He wades in from the landing craft. comes in behind the lines and glider planes. The ebb and flow of his blood determine the ebb and flow of the tide of battle. by that thin black line on the war maps, in newspapers and magazines and on the screen. As one general said, he is that line. If one of these men, any one of them, falls down on the job, a platoon may be lost, position may be lost, battle may be lost. If any one of these men falters, other men may die. Here are the units of war. The men whose deeds shape and change history. Foot soldier, doughboy, infantryman. Foundation for victory. And yet, look hard at these faces. You recognize one? You see a relative or a neighbor? Perhaps someone whose picture's been in the papers. No, you probably don't. You know them only as men in arms, men with drawn faces and with red eyes that have looked upon death. Men with heavy boots that sink into dust and mud and water. When the cans of film reach the war department from combat photographers overseas, they're accompanied by caption sheets that describe the scene. These caption sheets give place names like San Lo and Bologna and Saipan. And they give men's names like General So-and-so, Admiral So-and-so, so-and-so who won the Congressional Medal of Honor. 
but with film like this, the caption sheet as a rule refers simply to foot soldiers. It says, foot soldiers digging in, or foot soldiers moving up, or foot soldiers in action. The cameramen don't know their names either. There's so many foot soldiers, and there's so little time to chase around after last names, first names, and middle initials, and the bullets are chasing the man who's making the pictures. After looking at thousands of feet of film showing tens of thousands of unnamed foot soldiers, you start wondering about them, wondering where they're from, how they're feeling, what their names are. It's not inconceivable, for instance, that among this group of weary infantrymen is one whose birthday it was the day the film was shot. Perhaps this one, whose name perhaps is Fred. And you think that's a hell of a way for Fred to spend a birthday. This shivering fellow, we'll call him Sam. Does the snow feel soft and friendly, like the snow of his Minnesota? Or is he from San Diego and this his bit of baptism by cold? How about that, Sam? How long since this man hugged his own baby? His name might be Jerry. And you, boy in pain, what's your name? When it comes to names, it isn't so very much different on the home front. Identities are lost in the great lines of workers. These men and women, in their jobs, in the factories in which they toil, are lost in the monumental mass of workers and jobs and war plants. We think in terms of thousands of factories, millions of jobs, tens of millions of workers. We rarely think in terms of Charlie Town, working here on a machine gun trigger. Or Harry Gold, or Anna Boitukas, or Tom Pello, or Margaret Weingartner. They're the foot soldiers of industry. There's the anonymous, unglamorous tasks that add up eventually to glory and victory. Often their lot is dreary, monotonous, uninspired. Too often they do not even realize how their work is related to the dazzling concept known as winning the war. They don't understand how by their mere presence at their jobs, they're like the foot soldier at his station, creating a small change at the front. They too plug up little holes on great battlefields, produce little punches that emerge as great knockout blows. They're the human minutes and the long years of industry's war effort. They're the soaring black line on the chart that shows our progress in the battle of supply. They, too, are the foundation for victory. But let one of these foot soldiers falter at his job, and this foot soldier may die at a station. Unsung heroes, what are your names? What's your name, soldier? And yours, worker, and yours, and yours, and yours, and yours. And what was your name, fighting man? For this unknown soldier, the unknown worker is building a monument. This monument.